All right, I think everyone can relate to what our next guest is going to be talking about. Kate Hanley works as a coach and speaker to help busy women get fit and focus their minds so they can do the things that matter and stop stressing about the things that don't. She is the author of the Anywhere, Anytime Chill Guide and the 28 Days Lighter Diet. Are they here? Are your books here? Yep. All right, so the books are right outside. Great. And this seminar is Bite-Sized Serenity Solutions for Busy People. Please help me welcome Kate Hanley. Hello, everyone. It is so wonderful to be here. And what an honor to follow the Biggest Loser people. They're already gone, but oh my gosh, I love that show. Like, it's really exciting. Um, so yeah, I'm here to share Bite-Sized Serenity Solutions with you guys. I am, I like to call myself a yoga teacher for people who don't do yoga. Um, because I figure if you've got two plus hours to get to a yoga class, you're probably doing pretty good. I like to reach the people who think that they're too something to do yoga, uh, too old, too stressed, too ADD, too inflexible, too whatever, because these mind-body practice, and I'm going to define what I think mind-body practice is, whether they're formal like yoga or meditation or informal like weeding or knitting or sweeping or doing the dishes, have so much to offer us because they help us get quiet and hear what's true for us. Because here's the thing about being able to get quiet and hear what's true for you. What that gives you access to is your intuition. And when you have access to your intuition, then you know it's important. So you can focus on those important things. You can go do those important things. And that means that you don't have to distract yourself from not doing the important, you, you know, maybe you know there's something that you probably should do, but it's, you're not totally clear that it's, that's what you want to do. So you go about and you do all this stuff that doesn't really matter. And you get really stressed out. And you do things like get freaked out about your to-do list. So I like to help people. I like to, I use in yoga. Yoga was my way in. And I'm going to share a little bit about my story in a minute. Yoga was my way in to starting to realize like how powerful it is when you get quiet and how you can hear your intuition. But then once you start to do that, then your life starts to change. And it starts to change for the better. And you know, I'm here today, I'm so excited to be here today because women are such important people. Women, we take care of other people. We really know how to get things done. We take care of our families, we take care of our communities. In fact, the Dalai Lama says that the world will be saved by the Western woman. Like, that's how powerful we are. I'm getting a little bit of goosebumps, which is how I know that something like big is happening. We are in touch. Not only do we know how to get things done, and not only do we take care of other people, but we're also in touch with things like emotions, with things like intuition. We're not just about like the linear, the masculine, the next step, the next logical step. Like we know how to kind of tune into um, something deeper, and that's what the world needs right now. So I'm just curious, though, before I go any further. Does anybody read this and think, oh, God, we have to do that, too? <laughs> you know? Um, because how many people here would just describe themselves as pretty super busy? Yeah. How many people would say that they feel stressed on a pretty regular basis? Yeah. And how many people are excited about the thought of adding something to their to-do list? Yeah. <laughs> I hear you. Listen, I was totally there. And the reason that I'm actually standing on this stage here today is that five years ago, and I know it's exactly five years ago because it was right after my son was born and he celebrated his fifth birthday on April 6th. I was so completely overwhelmed with all that I had to do between working and taking care of him and getting food on the table and everything that literally all I could think about that day was just like, what were we going to have for dinner? That was my big vision. That was my big goal. I was just tapped out on everything else. And, um, and so I kind of know, like if you had told me that I was gonna be playing a role in saving the world, I would've been like, forget it, <laughs> I'm out of here. I got to go make mac and cheese. Um, so, <laughs> um, and I wanna know, so the reason that I'm here is that I wanna be able to tell you guys ways that you can find meaningful ways to slow down, to reduce your stress levels, to be able to just like, lower the, some of the defenses that we put up when we're stressed and when we're overwhelmed and when we're angry and cranky and just feeling put upon by the world. And do that by, by only by doing things that you're already doing. Just changing your awareness, shifting your intention, 
becoming a little bit more mindful, which is a word that gets bandied around a lot. I want to give us some really practical examples, and we'll do some exercises a little bit later in the talk. But when you can do that, when you can weave this stuff into your daily life, you get so much more done, and it takes so much less of a toll. I mean, we're getting so much great information here. Dr. K has put on this awesome event, and I'm so happy to be here. But is anybody sitting here listening and thinking like, oh, God, now I've got to do strength training. I've got to start counting my calories and taking pictures of my food. And then I should really, like, move more. And so how am I going to do that? And maybe I should go vegan. Like, anybody feeling a little bit of overwhelm? Yeah. So I'm here to tell you, you absolutely can do more by doing less. And that's what Bite Size Serenity for, is all about. Okay. So here's what is not going to help us save the world, this. This whole situation. Anybody resonate with this? Does this remind you? OK. We have the best of intentions when we're being really busy. We do. We're trying to get things done. We're trying to take care of our families. We're trying to do our work. We're trying to improve the world on some level. But we're kind of going about it wrong, because we're keeping ourselves so busy, and when you are from one thing to the next, you never have a moment to sit still, and you never have a moment to let your thoughts get quiet. And why do we need to have our thoughts get quiet? Because that's when you can hear your intuition. When you are running around from getting the kids off to school, picking up your dry cleaning on the way home, going to work, getting dressed, you know, checking your Facebook, going to your email box, going to your phone. You never give yourself a chance to just literally be in your body. I'm going to tell you your intuition lives in your body, whether you call it your gut or a feeling in your bones. It is inside your body. And so even if you're doing good things to take care of your body, you're like making good meals, but while you're making the good meals, you're thinking about what you're going to do as soon as you've done eating it. Or you're working out, you're at the gym, and you're on the treadmill, but you're watching CNN or Real Housewives or something while you're doing it, your mind and your body are not on the same page. They're in two separate places. It's not helping. It's just this. So when you can, the reason that you want to get your mind to focus on what your body is doing, because your mind is like a puppy, right? So anybody have dogs? Do we have dog lovers here? Yeah. What do puppies do? They run around the room and they chew on stuff, right? And they like, they're cute and they're adorable and you love them, but they're destroying your home. <laughs> and so this is the way that the mind is. It's running all over the place. It's bouncing from thing to thing. Oh my God, I forgot to send that email. What are we having for dinner? Blah, 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 blah. And it's just, it's creating stress. That's what the problem with busy is. It's stress. So getting, focusing on what your body is doing is the equivalent of giving your puppy a to chew toy. What happens when you give a puppy a chew toy? gets really quiet in the room, yeah. And all of a sudden, your couch is not getting destroyed anymore, which you know is the equivalent of your thoughts like totally stressing you out. It's kind of like causing this destruction. So that's my MO. That is why I'm here today, to teach you some ways, some very simple things that you can do, specific exercises, yes, but also some ways to start to bring it into things that you're already doing every day. Like I mentioned, doing the dishes, uh, chores. I mean, can anybody here? not have to do dishes for the next five days or not brush your teeth for the next five days. No, you can't get away from this stuff. So let's like bring a little bit more intention to that because there's so much to be gained on the other side. So what happens when you get your mind quiet by giving it a chew toy, which is focusing on something that your body is doing, is that you can hear your intuition. So what is intuition? I love this quote. It's from the autobiography of a yogi, which is a classic yoga text. It was written in the 50s by an Indian sage who was one of the people who's responsible for bringing yoga to the, to the West. His name is Maharishi. And he says that intuition is soul guidance appearing naturally during those instants when the mind is still. Soul guidance. I want more of that. Like, who doesn't want that? That's pretty important. Anybody having any kind of a drama right now, wouldn't you like a little bit of soul guidance about what to do about that? You know? Um, I feel like we go out and we poll our friends, maybe we talk to our therapist, maybe we talk to our parents, you know, we're looking for guidance, but it's coming from these other places that don't really know what's true for us. The only guidance that we ever really need is already contained within us. We just need to stop and listen to it. So, 
soul guidance appears naturally during those instants when the mind is still. I feel like I can kind of feel the energy getting quiet in here a little bit when people are like, oh, I could slow down, this is cool. So I wanna kind of back up a little bit though and tell you sort of how I came to be standing on this stage and why this stuff is so important to me. I uh, graduated from high school. I was valedictorian of my class. There wasn't an activity that I didn't do. I was in the junior Miss pageant. I was the co-consul of the Latin club. I played softball, I played soccer. Like I was trying to do things right. I went to college, I graduated cum laude. I got out in four years. I moved to San Francisco and I marched down to the temp agency to do what I had been preparing to do low these 21 years, which was get a job. I got a job at a broker dealer and it, like just whatever, I was like whatever, I just need a job. And I sat down at my desk that first day and it felt like this. Like I literally felt I could hear the cell door slamming behind me because I had, an, I had basically I had a nervous breakdown. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm supposed to do this for the rest of my life. For the next 50 years, I'm gonna be sitting in this office chair. And if it's not this office chair, it was just gonna be some office chair somewhere else. So, I was you know, kind of having a crisis. I was trying to do things right and then here I was. I wasn't really listening to, I didn't know anything about intuition or soul guidance or yoga or anything. I just was like trying to go by the book and I was miserable. So what I did was I would stay up late at night distracting myself from the fact that I had to get up and go to a job that I didn't like. And this was a really bad idea because I lived in San Francisco and I worked in the financial industry and the financial markets in San Francisco operate on East Coast time, which meant I had to be at work at 5.30 in the morning. So kind of shows you the extent to which I was not psyched about my where I was, because I was up at like one o'clock in the morning channel surfing when I stumbled across this movie, Midnight Express. Has anybody seen it? Okay, it's kind of a classic from the 70s. Um, it's about a young, attractive American man. You can see him there. He goes um, to vacation in Turkey with his girlfriend and he gets this really great idea. He's like, I'm gonna smuggle drugs out of the country and sell them at home except he gets busted and he gets thrown into a Turkish prison, which as you can imagine is this very chaotic, violent place. People are like stabbing each other in the <laughs> cafeteria. But there is one scene in this movie that completely changed my life. And just a little aside, I found out that this was written by Oliver Stone. This was his first screenplay. So in some ways, Oliver Stone is the reason that I'm here today. There's one scene where he and his cellmate are in their cell they don't have their shirts on, which was totally like helped get my attention for sure. They were attractive. The sun was streaming through the window and they were doing yoga. They were doing sun salutes. So they would raise their arms up. I can't do it quite in my um, jean jacket. They would bend over. There was no dialogue. They, you could like see the kind of sweat was glistening a little bit on their forehead. You could see that they were like breathing together and moving together and on their face, you could tell that they felt free. And I was like, oh, if that can help them deal with Turkish prison, maybe it can help me feel like I'm in jail with my job. So I was a real gym rat at the time. I just went to the gym all the time because it was right across the street from my work. And um, I went and looked on the schedule and there was one yoga class and I got so excited, but it was on Tuesdays at 2.30. This was 1992. Yoga was not everywhere the way that it is now. And I was just kind of like, oh, I guess that's not really for me. So my conscious mind sort of shut down when it saw that it wasn't available in this very easy and convenient way. It didn't occur to me to look somewhere else. I don't know, I was in my early 20s, I wasn't that, that clever. Um, but there was some part of me that heard that desire, like remembered that feeling of this. What if life felt more like this? Spacious, open, felt great, was beautiful. And some piece of me heard that. And for three years, I didn't go to yoga, even though I had seen the, um, seen the movie three years ago. And by this time, I had actually, I, I did what I could. I went and got myself a better job. I said, if I have to work all day, every day, well, I'm gonna get a job in publishing because I love to read and write. So I went and did that. But the only problem with that was it paid so little that I, I couldn't afford anything. I remember walking past the body shop. Remember when the body shop was like the big thing? And I was like, ah, oh, someday I'll be able to buy peppermint foot scrub. Um, so I was, you know, I was waiting. I, some part of me knew that this was possible and I worked my way up and everything and I even got raises, but still one day I loaned my car to a friend. He was rear-ended on his way home from the um, airport. My car was totaled, thankfully no one was hurt. And I got a check for $12,000 for my car. So do you know what I did? I 
quit my job. And that was the first, and you know what the first thing I did was? I went to yoga class. And is that, that was, I mean, I grew up all over the place when I was little. I've lived in the Northeast, I lived in Oklahoma, I lived in Alabama, I went to school in Virginia, and then I moved to San Francisco. That was the first time I ever felt at home when I was on that mat, trying to figure out where my big toe was. I mean, they were telling me things. I didn't have any idea where my body was, but I would get these glimpses. And it's been like the longest lasting relationship of my life when I started yoga at that time. That's also when I learned how to cook and how to take better care of myself. And so what I did is I started to like raise my awareness of things like intuition. I didn't know that that's what I was going for. I thought I was just going to help me deal with stress. And so that's why I call my, my talks bite-sized serenity for busy people because that's kind of our way in. We want help with our stress, right? But there's just so much more available to us when we start making regular times for us to just inhabit our bodies and hear what's going on just underneath the surface of our little puppy-like thoughts. Um, I do love yoga for the fact that it improves your digestion. I could list it all on my fingers and toes. You better sleep, you're stronger, you're more flexible. You can do crazy, learn to do crazy things that you never thought you would be able to do, like stand on your head. But the reason that I do it, and I share this picture because I was doing a little yoga and meditating. I was visiting my grandmother in Florida. And while I was med meditating, I heard this, this click because it was one of those disposable cameras. I mean, this was a long time ago. This was pre-digital. And she was like, you just look so happy. You know, it changes your energy. And it changes your life because the people around you start to notice that you're changing your energy. And it kind of opens a door in their mind, too, of, hey, maybe I could do this, too. Now this is the really cool thing. Yoga will change your life. Listening to your intuition will begin to change your life. Whatever your way in is, great, I love it. Stick with it long enough and it's going to completely change the trajectory of your life. I um, worked as an editor for many years and then I left my editorial job at iVillage.com. I was like working for a tech startup and I went to go do my yoga teacher training because I thought that I, that's what I wanted. Like yoga started to take on more and more of a presence in my life. The ironic thing is that when I did that intensive year long yoga teacher training where I was on the mat all the time, I heard something that I had never heard before was that what I really wanted to do deep down inside was be a writer. I hadn't even let myself acknowledge that as something that I would like to do because it's so impractical. Who can do that? That's ridiculous. You know, those are the kinds of little puppy thoughts that will talk you out of something that's pretty important. But when I did my yoga teacher training when I was done, instead of really starting to teach yoga classes, I started pitching articles in magazines. I covered wellness for whole living. I was published in Real Simple. I was published in Yoga Journal. I was published in Parents Magazine. I even got on the Today Show because I wrote my book. That's, how, that's when I pitched my book and I sold it. This was all happening because I was like following that I, was just, I just knew that every time I did yoga, I felt so much better. And every time that I listened to what I heard when I was feeling so much better, underneath my busy thoughts, something really cool happened. Now I blog for myself at MsMindBody.com and I blog for Acacia TV too, which is a really cool service they're giving away. I'm just on a little aside here. They're giving away a year long subscription. This is a streaming video, fitness video service. So they have like little 10 minute, 20 minute workouts, yoga videos, yoga DVD, uh, yoga workouts that you can do anywhere, you know? And they're really on board with this idea that you don't have to take an hour and a half plus to go to a yoga class. You can like fit it into your busy life. So I encourage you to check it out and go check it out in the raffle because a year of that would be amazing. So all this was going really well and then I had kids. <laughs> yeah. I mean, literally, that is how I felt. I had two kids in two years. After I had my first daughter, things were pretty good. Like, I was getting to yoga class once a week. It wasn't several times a week the way it had been before, but it was once a week. I could count on it, and I was doing yoga a lot at home. And then my second came. You guys, he's the sweetest baby. He smiled when he was, like, two days old. I mean, there's, he is not high needs. I can't even tell you exactly why, but his arrival just completely threw me under the bus. <laughs> I can look back now and see that probably there was some postpartum depression going on probably, um, but I just became, I got so overwhelmed by how much those kids were dependent on me and my husband that I just became a stress ball. And I thought to myself, I have this great idea. I am going to take this mind-body practice that I have been cultivating over the last 15 years and doing as much as I can over the last 15 years. I'm going to stop doing it altogether 
cold turkey immediately. This is so smart because I'm gonna save myself so much time that I'm gonna be able to get more done. I thought I was onto something. Ha 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 ha. I mean, things got so much worse when I did that. They got so much worse because I did not have any way to take my edge off. I did not have any way to check in with myself. What I started to do to take my edge off was I started to have wine. I mean, mom's and wine, it's a match made in heaven, yes. I still, I definitely believe in a glass of wine. You know, not every night. I try and keep it to the weekends. But still, I believe in a little yin and a little yang. But I was starting to have, like, my one glass of wine a night turned into two glasses of wine a night. Then it was like maybe two and a half and sometimes three. Well, guess what alcohol does to me? It doesn't let me sleep. So I had a two-year-old and a newborn and a wine habit that was further impeding my sleep. I was exhausted. And then I was completely cranky. So guess what I was doing? Picking fights with my husband. We were fighting about the dishes. We were fighting about his swaddling methods. I don't know. Like, I was, I was just picking a fight about everything. And so, you know, my mental well-being was taking a hit. My relationships were taking a hit. And this has been, by this time, this is 2010. So my industry is taking a hit. Whole living, closed. Natural Solutions Magazine stopped paying its writers. You know, like I was having myself a full bona fide crisis here. And this is when I decided to like stop doing mind body practice. This is hilarious to me. I really thought I was doing the right thing. Um, and the worst piece of it all was that I just really lost a vision for myself. Really, all I thought about was like, what are we going to have for dinner tonight? And I would cook this elaborate meal. The kids wouldn't eat it. Or they would have like three bites and then my son would throw it on the floor and my daughter would be like, I want mac and cheese. And then I would put, race to put them to bed. Bedtime was my least favorite part of time of day because I was trying to get them to bed by like 6.30 or 7 because they were little, right? And P.S. I wanted them to be in bed so that I could sit on the couch and stare at the wall or like watch TV and do nothing. Like I think we all sort of crave, think we're craving that time. And it was just, it was a real disaster. We lived in New York City. <laughs> we lived in a two bedroom apartment with four souls. It was not a happy time, but it was actually a wonderful time in retrospect. Would I like to go through it again? No. Am I glad it happened? Yes, because it helped me see. This is what women are going through. We feel like we're taking, we have all these people to take care of. We're trying really hard. We're trying to be smart and we're kind of it, coming at it from this stressful more and more and more place. And so we're making bad decisions for ourselves that don't really support ourselves. And so I had this vision of, this is where the seed was planted of women need help learning how to be true to themselves. I'm going to footnote that. I'm going to pause right there and then tell you how I got out of it. Because there was a turning point, and it didn't come too late, maybe not too much longer. Maybe my son was about nine months old. The way that I started to dig out of this hole was that I started to meditate while I nursed the baby to sleep. I did the most basic meditation for dummies technique that I knew, which was I counted my exhales. When I got to 10, I started again at 1. I was already sitting in a dark room. When we lived in New York City at the time, he slept in a closet. I'm telling you, it was pitch black dark in there. There was no windows. It was me and him in the clothes. He was, I couldn't move. I was immobilized. And so I thought to myself, well, what if I just meditate while I'm here? Everything started to change. My dad has this saying, the, the gates of history turn on tiny hinges. This was one of my hinges. Because what would happen is, First of all, I would sit there and I would count my breaths. And I would get off track. I would find myself on 17. I would find myself thinking about you know, something about work or something to get at the grocery store. And then I would just start again, which is what meditation practice teaches us to do. The beauty of just starting again. Don't beat yourself up. And then, when I would, and then I would sit there for a few minutes after he had fallen asleep. That's how I knew to stop. That was my cue to stop. And it didn't take that long, five, ten minutes. I would just sit there with him for a few minutes, just like loving having my baby in my arms. I mean, those days are gone now. That's never going to happen again. He was my last. So I got to savor a little bit of what was going on and not resist it, because otherwise I was resisting it. I was resisting this idea of night-night. <laughs> it was my least favorite time of day, right? So all of a sudden I started to look forward to what had previously been my least favorite time of day. That is a pretty big switch. And then I would put him down. I would walk out into the living room 
and I didn't have to take my edge off. I didn't have to either pick a fight with my husband about the dishes or the fact that he didn't wipe the counters in a way that I thought was suitable, what have you. Um, and I didn't have to drink the wine, you know? I came out and I wasn't like, Ugh. I was more like, oh, how's it going? Something else that I did in those times, and that was my whole practice, literally, those 10 minutes counting my exhales. And then I started to build onto it a little bit because, you know, we all have our favorite or least favorite domestic tasks. One that I actually enjoyed was sweeping. And I turned sweeping at night because I lived with toddlers. <laughs> we had piles of stuff on the floor and there's, I mean, I can ignore dirty dishes in the sink, I can ignore a dirty bathroom, but I cannot ignore walking across the floor and hearing crunch, 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 crunch. So I got my broom and I turned it into my yoga practice. I just let myself really feel the fact that my feet were on the floor, that I was moving around the room. I could hear the swish, swish, swish of the bristles. I could just like kind of be like, where's my elbow? How does my elbow move? I mean, just really the simplest thing. I just paid attention to sweeping, which is all a mind-body practice is. It's focusing on something that your mind, your body is doing. It could be something physical, like a yoga pose, or sweeping, or it could be something more subtle, which is still physical, like your breath, counting your breath. You're focusing on your breathing. Your mind is focusing on your body. So mind-body practice is actually this really huge potential of things. It doesn't have to be something formal like yoga or meditation. Although I do love both those things, and we're going to do a few of those things right now. Um, but that's what I would do. So then I kind of took it to another level. So I would come out of the bed of my baby's closet. I can't call it a bedroom. <laughs> and I would be a little bit more calm. And then I would started to say to my husband, like, "Hun, I need about, I just need a few minutes before we sit down and start talking, because we lived in New York City, so like the kitchen and the living room and the dining room were all the same room. <laughs> and, and I would just like, you know, kind of just be quiet and sort of be with myself. My husband had to kind of think I was nuts, and then he started to see that I was much more fun to talk to. And so he got into it too, and I believe that he got kind of a contact relaxation because I was doing it in the room with him. Like that picture my grandmother took of me, I think it's important to let the people that we love see us doing these things because it benefits them. And then that's when we started to be able to do things like make decisions. Like maybe it's time to move out of New York City. We both work for ourselves and we have two young children. <laughs> you know, before we couldn't even think about that stuff. Or if we thought about it, it would be like, oh God, we can't think about it. Like, oh, we have to like go to work so that we can pay our mortgage, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, and that's when just like, another round of changes came, and that's when I really started to see. After I had taken it away, removed that um, access for myself, when I stopped mind-body practice, I start to, started to see like how the information that I heard was what was the most valuable thing about it. And so what I would like to do right now, honestly, is to pause my talk and try meditating we're gonna do it in a couple of different ways because there is no law that says you have to do it in any one way, shape, or form, and there's no law that says you even have to be sitting down in a quiet room, but we are sitting down, and when I stop talking, it'll be a quiet room, so let's give it a shot, okay? So the first thing that I wanna ask you to do is bring the soles of both feet to the floor. That right there is a mind-body practice. If you're in a uh, meeting at work, you're like kind of zoning out at the conference table and you know you want to stay awake, you know you want to pay attention, just choose to put both feet on the floor. All of a sudden you're thinking about the bottom of your feet. Your mind is paying attention to something that your body is doing. It's going to give you something to focus on enough that you'll be a little bit more open, a little bit more present. And then if you can, I invite you to scoot to the edge of your seat so that you're, you are going to be supporting your own spine. Okay? And then imagine that there is a string. Oh, we have these lovely balloons. Imagine there is a balloon with a string that is attached to your head. The balloon is rising up and it's lengthening your spine upward. It doesn't have to be like you don't have, we're not talking about standing at attention, and, but just like, you know, if you normally you might find yourself sitting like this, just loop. And the first technique that we're going to do is we're going to do the one that pretty much saved my bacon which is counting your exhales, okay? So I invite you to close your eyes if you want to close your eyes. If you prefer to keep them open, absolutely, please keep them open. I am gonna time us, we're gonna do one minute of this. I want you to silently count your exhales, just your exhales. When you get to 10, start again at one. 
If you find you're on 17, start again at one. If you find you're thinking about what you're gonna eat when you leave this room, start again at one, okay? So we're gonna start officially, the clock starts now. Okay, that's been a minute. No, 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 I see you guys are sitting back. Wait, no, we're gonna try a different one now. <laughs> because I think it's cool to see that there is no one right way, right? And if you try a couple of different ones, there's naturally going to be one that you kind of like and you get a little bit more excited about than the others and there's nothing better than excitement. And just like, ooh, I wanna do that again. So this time, still, soles of the feet flat to the floor if you're able, sitting on the edge of your seat cushion if you're able, imagining the uh, balloon lifting your head up so that your chest can be open, your tummy can be soft. And what we're gonna do is just listen, okay? So pretend that you are a tape recorder. A tape recorder does not, we tend to focus in on one sound. You guys are probably trying to listen to my voice right now. Bless you if you are, like I really appreciate your attention but there's all of these other sounds happening that we're not really aware of. And what I love about this form of meditation is that it helps you kind of tap into just like the richness of our experience at any given point in time and how there's a lot more that's going on that you could pay attention to than just like, well, you should do that or that'll never work or blah, 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 whatever's going on in there, okay? So here we go. It starts now. Okay, that was another minute. You guys have meditated for two minutes. Like, that's, that's awesome. Anybody hear anything surprising? Like I heard, it was kind of amazing to me. I could hear someone's high heels, like click, click, right? Would you ever have known that you could hear someone that clearly who's 50 feet away from you? Um, okay, last one. And this one, we're just gonna do a very traditional meditation where you just pay attention to your breathing. Like you can tune into some physical aspect of it. You can sort of try and feel where your body changes as you inhale and exhale. Maybe you can feel your rib cage sort of subtly move away from each other and then back together. Maybe it's the air moving past your nose, like into your nose and down into your lungs. Um, this is really just, it's breath awareness. It's the most basic and probably universal technique. And so let's do that for one minute. And then I just want to talk a little bit about, see if anybody had a favorite. So pay attention, okay? Let me know. I'm going to want to know. Okay. And the minute starts now.
Okay. And then it's over. You may sit back in your chair now. <laughs> Thank you for playing with me. I'm curious though, how does, can somebody describe in a word or two like how they feel in this moment? Relaxed. Relaxed. Yeah. Anybody else? What? Calm. You yawned? So maybe you're tired. Calm, calm. she said. Yes, calm. calm. People, three minutes. Th three minutes. Somebody raise your hand who thinks they don't have three minutes for themselves in the course of a day. Yeah. I mean, literally, this is all it takes. I mean, granted, more is better, but anything is better than none. Anything. Think about, I mean, I challenge you to think about what do you do every day and how could you start to weave in some of this paying attention to what your body is doing? If you, how many people have kids? Yeah, okay. You are, you've just dropped them off at school or walked them to the bus stop or dropped them off at the bus stop or what have you, or you're driving to work and you're just about to get into work. You know what? Don't hop out of the car right away. Sit there. Meditate for three minutes. Like you're going to feel different. You're going to be able to go into whatever it is that you do next, like open and aware and calm and relaxed and not reactive. If you are working out, exercising, getting your fitness, I, I challenge you to not watch TV while you're at the gym. Or if you're going on a walk, to not listen to a podcast. Now, my heart just broke a little bit even saying that because I love listening to podcasts on a walk. So if you want to listen to your podcast on a walk, halfway through your walk, find a beautiful spot, turn the podcast off, sit down, meditate for three minutes. And then when you're ready, put your podcast back in and walk home. Like it's very easy to incorporate into things that you're already doing. You can meditate while you brush your teeth. Just pay attention. Pay very close attention. Oh, look at that. How does that feel? Oh, what's going on over here? <laughs> I mean, you can't not brush your teeth. How many people get good ideas in the shower? Yeah. Did you know they make pads you can hang on the shower wall and write ideas down? But you know what you're doing when you're showering? You're meditating in motion. You're like concentrating on what you're doing. You're not running, you're, your mind is not bouncing around to a lot of different places. Ladies, I'm, I'm telling you, I, my husband and I used to fight about doing the dishes, especially in those months after my second son was born. But before that, I mean, before we even moved in together, he's a messy Marvin. God bless him. I love that man, but he is messy. <laughs> and we used to fight about the dishes. And I tell you what, when I started to, I mean, I do believe in balance and I do believe in fairness, but there's always going to be dishes to be done. We could fight about who's going to do the dishes, or you could look at the dishes in the sink and be like, I'm just going to do these dishes and I'm going to pay attention to doing the dishes. And when I'm done, I'm going to feel calm and I'm going to feel relaxed. I might notice how tired I am. Maybe it'll help me get in bed a little bit earlier tonight instead of stay up and watch TV thinking that I'm relaxing. Um, and something else really cool is going to happen when you start weaving these little pockets into your day. And that is you're going to start to hear information. Did anybody like think of a person or a, a thing or an email that they hadn't responded to when we were doing that meditating? It's something just like naturally arise while you were there. This takes a little bit longer to do, but you can, I promise you that insights will bubble up when you quiet the mind. Intuition is soul guidance that arises naturally when the mind is, in those moments when the mind is still. I know that if I'm sitting down at my desk, I've got a busy day, I've got to pick the kids up at 3.30, I've got like three hours and I've got to eat and I've got to make a phone call, that I can stand up, maybe go water the plants, really allow myself to like sink into that event of watering the plants. And I am going to think of something or I'm going to have an idea about something. And that something is the most important thing that I could focus on every single time. It might not make sense. Why am I thinking about that? I don't know, but I tell you when I go back to my computer and I take care of that thing first, something cool always happens, something cool that I didn't expect. Um, and it might not necessarily be the thing that I feel the, would feel the greatest about chop, checking off my to-do list, but it always has this amazing result because intuition is soul guidance. Life can work things out for us better than we can for ourselves, honestly, but we have to be listening. I like to think of your intuition as your inner Yoda. <laughs> so Yoda does not stand up here with a PowerPoint and bullet everything out for you. Yoga talks in this funny, Yoda talks in this funny little whispery voice. 
He uses these strange metaphors. You're not exactly sure what he means. You got to kind of like brew on it a little while, right? And you have to like talk to him regularly. And then you start to understand what he's saying. <laughs> so this is what I'm talking about. Instead of you feeling like you have to wait until you have those two plus hours to go to a yoga class or that until you feel like you can sit for 30 minutes in meditation, you are going to miss so much information, so much information. So that's why these little bits of time really become so powerful and add up to the greater than the sum of their parts. But it takes time to develop that relationship. It's not easy. In the beginning, you're going to think, why did I think of that? That doesn't make any sense. Oh, no, no, no. I'm not going to pay attention to that. So that's why I have developed... This is my roadmap to kind of how to integrate the information that you get from your intu intuition into your life. I call it the five re's. I think it's pretty clear they all start with re. But this is your formula for serenity. This is how you start to, first of all, give your, create the quiet just so you can calm down. And listen, if that's all that ever happens is you just like start to take a couple minutes for yourself during the day and you just feel calmer, like that's a huge win. That is a huge, huge win. But if you're ready to like start to consider the fact that there are things, that, other things that you could be doing that would have this greater impact in your own life, in your family's life, and perhaps in the, in the world, like the Dalai Lama believes you can do, <laughs> this is how you start to do it. So the first re is reflect. And this is the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. Reflecting is creating a moment of quiet for yourself and giving your puppy mind a chew toy. You don't necessarily have to sit down and be like, I'm going to figure this out. <laughs> I'm just going to create some quiet for myself. Maybe it's sitting on that rock in the middle of your walk for five minutes. You're going to start to hear some information, right? Because you are creating time for reflection. And then the second re is receive. So receive is kind of a tough one for us. Americans, go-getters, type A. I mean, who, who here are like list makers, kind of considers yourself type A? Anybody? Yeah. I mean, hands up, I mean, hats off for raising your hand. Because I think a lot of us are like that, but we don't necessarily admit it. <laughs> and it's good to know about yourself. Because the thing is, is that the conscious mind, the puppy mind, is going to start to dismiss the stuff that you hear. If I sit down and meditate and I think, oh, I really got to email this one woman back, this like email from three weeks ago that I've totally forgotten about until that moment, my puppy mind is going to say, but there's all those other emails that are more recent. Why are you going to do that one? That doesn't make any sense. You know, I'm, I would not be receiving that information if I dismissed it as soon as it came in. And listen, I talk to women all day long, and my, my coaching clients, we, they will, I'll ask them a question. They'll tell me clear as a bell, like, what they know to be true. And then I'll say, well, what are you going to do about that? And the first thing they do is they start to launch in all the reasons why they can't do it. And I get it. I mean, that's the way our mind works. But that doesn't mean it's the truth. It's not the truth. It, they make, those reasons, those dismissive reasons, may make a ton of sense. Yes, you have some other things that are more urgent, or you have some other things to do that are more, um, more recent. So if you could just take care of them, then you wouldn't have to think about them, and that would be really great. Or that might, it might just seem like a weird thing to do. But if you're, being, if you're like, well, I'm really going to receive this, I'm going to let this in, then that's when you can start to trust the information. That's when you can start to take an action on it. And action is the respond part. So notice it's not react. <laughs> react is what we do when we don't think. React, react is what we do when we don't reflect, when we don't like let the information come in. We react and we say something snarky or something mean or something. We just like totally don't broach the subject. We just step away from it altogether. And that's when we start to kind of create these dramas, like the fights that I would pick with my husband that aren't really about the thing that's wrong, you know, but you don't have to deal with the thing that's wrong. If you've got this, if you've just started this other little fire over here, I'll just fight with my husband instead of figuring out what I really want to do with my life. Hey, we've all been there from time to time. So when you respond, Responding is choosing how to respond. It's an amazing thing. It, that is when you change your life, is when you choose how to respond instead of merely react. And then the fourth re, I think, is the most powerful, and that's release. So what you do is you create the silence for yourself to hear the information. You let it in. You like take it in enough, and then you respond based on something that you took in. And then you know what you do? 
You let the universe take the care of the rest of it. I saw this Facebook meme the other day, and I couldn't find it. I really want to put it in my PowerPoint for next time. It's this awesome photo. It's like a beautiful landscape of Bali or something, you know, just like one of those places you're like, take me there now. And at the bottom it says, relax, nothing is under your control. <laughs> I mean, it's true. It's not. We're responsible for our actions, and we're responsible for how we respond to input from other people or, you know, developments in life or world events. But once we take our action, man, our job is done. Then we just sort of wait, and we get feedback. And we, then we decide, then we go through the process again. That's why the fifth re is repeat. So if you've taken an action, maybe you've decided that, like for me, that I wanted to, um, I wanted to start freelancing as a journalist, and I sent out my first query. Like, I didn't need to call that editor 10 times and get her to assign me the story. I needed to wait and see what happened. Did she write me back? Did she ask me for a different idea? Did she say this idea won't work, but please send me another? You know, then I could decide how I wanted to. I could go through the process again and figure out what to do next. Um, this is like an incredible cycle that will serve you so incredibly well. And in the beginning, you know, it takes a little while. You kind of are thinking like, what step am I on? What do I do now? Like you kind of have to walk yourself through it. It can be a little bit different than just like, oh, you said that, well, blah, 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 <laughs> you know? But you can get to the point where you can do this in a matter of seconds, especially if you're regularly taking these it's one, two, three minute periods and you're kind of bringing down your overall stress level, right? And then you go to like Thanksgiving dinner at your grandma's house and your uncle is there who likes to talk politics really loud and like usually you would either get into a fight with him or you would retreat to the kitchen or you would maybe even decide not to go. He can say something and you can sort of run through those steps sort of immediately. Like you can decide to bring both soles of the feet to the floor and take a deep breath before you say something back to him. And then you might have the wherewithal instead of saying like, you're full of it, Uncle Joe. <laughs> you might have a moment to be like, really? Well, what about this? You know, you might have it create enough space for yourself to become curious, to ask a question instead of just like dive right into the conflagration or run into the kitchen and just like shut down, never talk to Uncle Joe again, really, except for pass the peas. Um, you can get faster and faster at this. And actually, I teach on this. I have a whole program that I teach online. It's a six-week at-home study program. I'm trying to tell you as much as I can in the time that we have, and I'm almost up. In fact, I'm probably going to go over a teeny bit. But um, if anybody's interested in that, I have sign-up sheets. I'm going to be at the Book Nook at, right after this. And I also I love everybody that I share a space with. I have, I like to stay connected. If you would like to stay connected, I have an email newsletter and everybody who signs up gets a free ebook from me. It's called 14 Strategies for Serenity and it's like one simple thing to do for 14 different difficult emotions like anger or resentment or indecision, what have you. And I have sign up sheets at the book nook. So I'm gonna head right out there and you could just sign up and get your free gift or we could talk about what the program is. It's called Kate's Reboot Camp and it really goes into these five steps. If you're just one of the people out there who's like, I want more about that. But you may be able to, be able to get everything that you need from this and start to put it into practice. And that would be so awesome because I'm telling you, five years ago, I was sitting in that room <laughs> with my son breathing and had this glimpse of maybe other women need to learn how to do this too, right? And now here I am on this stage and I've got a book coming out in December. Like wonderful things can happen. And when you start to do this process, this is the other really cool thing that happens. You get to let go of a lot of crap. Anger, resentment, keeping score, needing to win, needing to wow them, feeling like however much you get done is how good you can feel about yourself at the end of the day, feeling put upon, driving yourself to the point that you burn out, or feeling so overwhelmed like you just don't know what to do. Like it's possible when you start listening to your gut and start trusting it and respecting it and taking actions based on that, like you don't have time for this crap. You kind of got to let it go. And let me tell you something, that feels amazing. That's how you get to get more done and it takes less of a toll. Because it's not the doing of the things really that takes the toll. It's how we feel about the doing of the things. It's all this stuff that makes you sick, that makes you tired, that like challenges your relationships, that just kind of makes you put the blinders on, you know? 
and start to not see the possibilities that are around you because you're sort of keeping yourself occupied with this stuff. And listen, I've been there, like I've been there, and it's so changeable. In fact, just to come back to the dishes for a minute, so my husband and I used to fight about the dishes and kind of for a long time, and then I went through this process where I gradually started to see like, I could just use the dishes as part of my like me time. I could just focus on doing the dishes. Thich Nhat Hanh, there's some of his books out back in the book nook. He's, it's a, you know, he's a, like a living Buddha, basically. He writes all these books about mindfulness. He calls it washing the dishes to wash the dishes. It's not wash the dishes so that you can go watch TV. It's not wash the dishes so that you can go to the grocery store. It's washing the dishes simply because they're there and because they need it. They need to be washed. So I started to do that, and I kind of I, I left all this stuff at the kitchen door. Like, I didn't bring it in there, and then there wasn't all this uh, around the dishes anymore. And now my husband does the dishes, like, way more than he ever used to. In fact, he has, he, I blog at MsMindBody.com, and so he, like, discovered that he can call up um, stand-up comics on YouTube on his phone, put the phone in his pocket. He's got this whole system. He puts the phone in the oven mitt, and then he clips the oven mitt to his men, right? Like, I love them, but they're, like, I love their nutty ingenuity. And then he clips it to his belt, and then he puts the um, headphones in, and I'll be upstairs, like, tucking the kids in, and I can hear him in the kitchen just laughing, just having so much fun. He's having fun doing the dishes. And I came down one day, and I was like, what, were you, what are you doing? And he showed me his rig, and he said, babe, you got to blog about this. So that's the kind of thing, like, you shift your energy, you let go of this stuff, and then the people around you get to do it too. It's pretty cool. That's where women, that's where we're really gonna be able to lead the way. Like, we have, to, we have to be the emotional leaders in our household. And then when you let go of that stuff, and this is where I will leave you, this is what becomes possible, right? You can see the horizon. You can imagine the possibilities. I love this image, too, because it's not like you have to go out. I mean, that Dalai Lama quote is a little intimidating. Oh, my God, we've got to save the world. But you know what? You can just like focus in on your little thing. Like, this is my thing. My thing is talking to you guys, helping you like figure out what matters most to you and do that instead of stressing about the stuff that doesn't. If I'm doing my thing, then I'm going to help somebody else, and they're going to do their thing that's going to help somebody else. That's how we're going to change the world, just by really owning what's true for us and then acting on it. So this is what becomes possible. That is the end of my talk. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it.